in the name of Mother Russia. Do not watch this video. I repeat, do not watch it. You turn it off right now. Excuse me, President Micropenis. How about you just shut the f up, huh? And you watching this video, you watch it. Don't listen to that imperial scum. Watch it now. Hi there, kids of the internets. It's Old Man Laundry, your friendly elder leftist and experienced political professional. Today, we are going to be talking about Ukraine, online leftists, and what they both have to do with our word of the day, credibility. Now, I know that the word credibility scares a lot of you kids, especially those of you in the back of the class who've obviously been eating a lot of glue, looking at you, Mr. Piker, but it shouldn't scare you. In fact, what should scare you are the consequences of not knowing what makes credibility so important and how often it's the glue eaters in the back of the class who are declaring themselves to be credible people in life and death matters and how for some reason so many of you think that it's a good idea to listen to them. <sighs> History shows us that there are few things as dangerous as granting authority to uncredible dipshits. Think about this dipshit and think about all of the consequences that came from his election in 2016. And now think about this dipshit. And again, think about all of the consequences that have resulted from his reign up to and including his choice to invade Ukraine. Now, what does all of this have to do with the left? Well, the answer, again, is our word of the day, credibility. On a recent stream, leftist creator Vosh lamented the fact, and rightly so, that many of the most prominent figures in the online left, along with many thankfully not prominent figures in the online left, have been so incredibly wrong about Russia's intent to invade the sovereign nation of Ukraine and have given such crap takes after they've invaded Ukraine as well. At one point in his video, which is linked below, he said this. The problem is a lot of people based their incorrect predictions off of trusting the Russian government. I have no idea what would lead any person in the left to trust the Russian government. Well, Vosh, I do have an idea. Credibility. Now, of course, Russia is not a credible source of truthful information, particularly when it comes to their geopolitical interests and their military gamesmanship. So then why would so many ostensibly leftist creators buy the Kremlin's bullshit, whether it comes straight from Putin's mouth or has been distributed through one of his many propagandists? In my view, there can only be a few real possibilities here, and they all have to do with credibility. Possibility number one is that many online leftists don't really know how to assess credibility. Possibility number two is that many online leftists consider credibility to be a dirty word of some sort. And the last possibility is that many online leftists are just ambivalent about the subject of credibility. Allow me to elaborate. I've actually been thinking about the topic of credibility in the online left for quite a while now, well before the invasion of Ukraine. In fact, I've been thinking about this subject ever since I watched Vosh debate Professor Flowers, and then even more so after he debated Mike from PA. The reason being is that both Flowers and Mike spoke in a very authoritative tone, but also came off as profoundly uncredible people. Now, intrigued by this dichotomy, I wanted to make sure that I was giving a fair assessment of them. So when their debates were over, I tried to learn more about their backgrounds on the subject that they were talking about. Now, in the case of Flowers, my curiosity started honestly with a general disbelief that any credible university would be cool with one of their professors publicly advocating for black separatism and arguably for genocide as well. So I turned to Google to see where was she a professor? But as it turns out, of course, she's not a professor at all. She just uses the title of professor for the air of credibility that it gives her. At this, I, honestly, I was annoyed as annoyed with what I perceived as dishonesty on her part by presenting herself as a professor when she wasn't one. I thought, you know, it's kind of messed up. Who actually is this woman? So once again, I turned to Google to see what her real name was and then find more information. But I couldn't find her name anywhere. And I dug. Now, had I found her real name, I would have been able to properly assess her credibility. For example, what if it turned out that she had actually written an article a few years ago aggressively calling for ethnic cleansing of every white person across the globe. 
Well, that would certainly cut at her credibility, wouldn't it? Especially since she denied to Vosh that she would be personally in favor of white genocide, even though she would be kind of sort of open to it if that's what the colonized people wanted. So really, for all I know, and by all appearances, she's literally just some random black separatist and genocide apologist with a YouTube channel. Is that what makes her credible? I mean, really, until proven otherwise, despite speaking in an authoritative way, my instincts were right that she actually has no unique credibility apart from the color of her skin. Now, to be clear, I don't think that Professor Flowers or anyone else should be required to be bona fide experts on a thing to talk about that thing, including here on YouTube. Everyone has a right to free speech. That's a big deal, but so too is realizing that not all speech is equal and not all speakers are equal either. I, for example, am not equal to President Biden. If I said that I was going to send troops to Moscow, no one would care. But if President Biden said that, his words would carry far more weight and there'd be big consequences because when he speaks on military deployments like that, he has real authority and credibility, whereas I don't. Because there's a big difference between speaking like a credible authority figure on a subject and actually being a credible authority figure on a subject. Which brings us then to Mike from PA, a guy who clearly believes that the way you increase your authority and credibility is to simply increase the volume of your voice and the pettiness of your insults. When I listened to Mike arguing with Bosch, I felt very similar vibes from him as I did with Professor Flowers, except for this one intriguing moment in their argument. As one of the things that you can do and has been done successfully by a lot of cities is you annex outlying areas. This is a, so a lot of cities are gerrymandered where the suburbs, where a lot of the higher income people of cities live is not part of the actual urban core. So what you do is you hollowed out the tax base. One of the things you do is you annex outlying areas. Since I have a background in urban planning, I was briefly impressed with Mike. I was impressed because he was kind of speaking my language. So when their spat was over, as I did with Flowers, I dug into Mike's background to get a better sense of his credibility on the topics that he was bringing up. To his credit though, and I really mean that, Mike hasn't made it impossible to dig into his background like Flowers has and like so many other leftists have as well. But when you see that Mike's credibility is completely undercut by his past and current lived experience, you start to understand one of the possible reasons why so many people hide behind pseudonyms in this space. For example, Mike told Bosch that his, Mike's credibility comes from having gotten candidates elected at some point in the past, but he wouldn't name names. Who those people are and when he helped them is quite relevant since it turns out that most of his life, Mike was a Republican. If Mike from PA elected Republicans or neoliberals and now he's out here using that experience in an effort to boost his political credibility and diminish Vosh's without being transparent about all of that, I'm sure that even Mike's audience would be able to see how incredibly problematic that would be. And then there's this weird thing where Mike is obsessed with performing as if he's this tough guy, grown-ass man. Because then you actually come to find out that Mike is a 37-year-old dude living with his rich parents while pretending to be a man of the people and macho man Randy Savage or some shit. He also repeatedly postured against Vosh as being some kind of expert and radical champion of urbanism over those dang suburbanite leeches who are destroying thriving city centers without noting that he lives with his Republican parents in their mega mansion in an exclusive suburb that could not be more antithetical to urbanism and what he obsessively talks about sewer socialism. So then where does Ukraine come into the equation? Well, there have been, unfortunately, a lot of leftists with god-awful takes about the subject of Ukraine, but few have been more consistently and significantly wrong about what's going on in Ukraine than Hassan Piker, a man who has clearly been drinking from the trough of Russian propaganda, arriving at asinine conclusions, and just regurgitating it all back to his massive audience who, sadly for the most part, seem to just lap that shit right up. But why? Why? Why would Piker do the bidding of Russian imperialism like that? And why would his audience go along with it? Well, let's start with the man himself, Mr. Piker. 
could it be that Mr. Piker has an aversion to credible sources because leftists aren't immune to resenting or distrusting expert opinions? Possibly. I mean, experts aren't always right, and there certainly are more than enough reasons to, at the very least, be suspicious of U.S. and international intelligence experts. Or maybe he's the sort of leftist that considers the idea of credibility to be a form of gatekeeping. Maybe, but going back and watching what he said about COVID-19 suggests that he's cool with listening to credible voices over uncredible dipshits like Joe Rogan. So it doesn't seem like an anti-expert, anti-credibility bias is the biggest issue going on here, if it's an issue at all. But considering that Piker was able to appropriately conclude that on the subject of COVID-19, that listening to someone like Joe Rogan over someone like Dr. Fauci is just lunacy due to Dr. Fauci's verifiable immense credibility on the subject as compared to Rogan, who has none, that would mean Piker's reason for spewing uncredible Russian propaganda to his audience isn't that he doesn't know how to assess credibility of his sources. Which leads us with one final option. Might it just be that he doesn't really care all that much about credibility? I mean, honestly, if you buy into the whole Occam's razor idea that the simplest answer is usually the correct one, the notion that he's just not all that interested in credibility is about as easy of a case as you could make. After all, Piker is the biggest leftist creator there is, feels largely untouchable, lives the kind of life that most people can only dream of, and has built this huge empire on incredibly low effort content. So one could argue, why put in the extra effort of assessing the credibility of the sources that he's using to arrive at his conclusions? Piker, being the successful capitalist that he is, knows that under capitalism, if he's largely gone off what feels right until now, and you look at where it's got him personally, why do anything different? You might say, as I would, because he has a responsibility to, but ugh, responsibility is so much extra work, isn't it? So maybe the more important question is, why does Piker's audience treat him as a credible voice on foreign policy, especially on Ukraine? Why, after establishing himself as a fountain of bad information on the war in Ukraine, why is Piker, according to Dot .esports, hitting record viewership numbers for his coverage of Ukraine? Especially when there, honestly, are just so many better options out there. Let's go back to the three possibilities from before, and this time apply them to Piker's audience. Does Piker's audience know how to assess credibility? Does his audience consider credibility to be a dirty word, maybe? Or is his audience just ambivalent about credibility? The possibility of credibility being a dirty word is always an option, but I don't see that as being the biggest factor here. And considering the scale of Piker's audience, it's hard to get a good sense of their feelings on the overall importance of credibility. It really seems to me that there are two things going on here. Number one, it doesn't seem like the majority of his audience really cares if Piker is credible or if the information that he's sharing is credible because they don't go to Piker for credible analysis and, you know, super well thought out ideas that he can defend against somebody else in a debate. The truth is they tune into Piker's streams for many of the same reasons why right wingers, libertarians and some other people tune into Joe Rogan. Rogan and Piker are highly entertaining to a specific type of person. Actually, strip away the rightward leanings of Rogan and the leftward leanings of Piker, and you are left with remarkably similar people. The two of them are entertaining personalities that relish in the unfiltered tough guy aesthetic, which is very appealing to a particular audience, usually people who are kind of dopey and insecure, and seeking a macho daddy figure to make them feel safe and validated in their ignorance and arrogance. To those people, credibility is irrelevant. But let's assume, let's be charitable here and assume that not all of Piker's audience is like that, or maybe that even the majority of them are not like that, and that a significant proportion of his audience does care about credibility. For those people, do they know how to assess somebody's credibility? Because valuing credibility and knowing how to assess it are, of course, two different things. Determining credibility is both an art and a science. It's both a skill and a process, usually one that you're supposed to learn about in grade school. Let's start things off by getting a definition of credibility. This one comes from changingminds.org. A credible person is an expert, experienced, qualified, intelligent, and skilled and trustworthy, honest, fair, unselfish, and caring. Credibility is also context-dependent, and an expert in one situation may be incompetent in another. 
Now that we've got that definition, let's outline a process for determining somebody's credibility. Rasmussen University suggests there are a number of areas for consideration. Among them, authority, bias, care taken, and indicators of quality. So let's see what happens when we apply these metrics to Mr. Piker. Again, remembering that credibility is context dependent, we need to ask specifically, does Piker have the credentials, academic background, or experience to speak authoritatively about the topic of Ukraine? So let's check, does he have a degree in this topic? Well, actually, according to Wikipedia, Piker graduated with honors from Rutgers in 2013 with a double major in political science and communications. This certainly is a plus, but at the same time, as someone who has a double major in political science and public administration, I can tell you that simply attaining a degree in poli-sci doesn't make you a political expert. It's also worth noting that after earning his poli-sci degree, Piker went straight into the communications field, embedded himself into a highly insulated, what some people would call champagne socialist lifestyle. And he hasn't left that bubble ever since, which is to say that degrees do matter, but only so much. What matters here is that yes, he has one, but what matters also, and maybe more, is what he's done with it since he got it. Which brings us to biases. With respect to the invasion of Ukraine, a few prominent biases of his really shine through, in my opinion. First and foremost is his very lazy anti-American bias. Second is his posturing as a socialist communist icon. Taken together, these biases lead him to adopt an America bad, Russia good mentality that leads him to a lot of really bad takes. He's also undeniably biased by his capitalist impulses. There's no way around the fact that Piker loves making and spending money. And when money is your underlying motivation, the things you say and do are biased. And from the perspective of someone who lives in the Midwest, Piker's geographic and cultural biases are glaring as well. Now, this is going to be a hot take, but we also can't completely dismiss the consideration of precisely where Mr. Piker is getting his millions. Some leftist creators have taken the very commendable step of making their monthly gross earnings publicly available, which is more than can be said about Mr. Piker. Piker's earnings are only public information now to some degree, thanks to a somewhat recent leak of Twitch streamer earnings. But did that leak really let us learn anything other than that Piker is getting a lot of money from somewhere? Maybe an analogy would help here. He's a political content creator. So let's think about how this would apply to politicians. You can go on to fec.gov and see the names of every person who donated to every candidate for federal office and exactly how much money they gave. But what if we couldn't look that up? What if all we got to see was the final dollar amount, the final balance? It's not that hard to see how that could become extremely problematic extremely fast. But we don't hold to the same standard the people who try to influence which candidates we support. And personally, I think it's high time that we have a serious conversation about that. But putting aside the ways Piker may be influenced by money, he's still obviously very biased, which diminishes his credibility somewhat. But let's be real too. Every political content creator and most mainstream media is quite biased as well, which is why Rasmussen states that it's acceptable to use biased information as long as you understand it is biased and you acknowledge that, and that you need to be aware of your own biases as you consume and use information. Finally is the issue of quality and care. You want, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about the Ukrainian constitution. I don't give a fuck about the Ukrainian like border sovereignty that some of you dumbasses are fucking talking about. Like you're, you're like a three percenter, but for Ukraine. Okay. It's so stupid. Does Piker make claims that are backed up with documented and well-cited sources? And are his sources of high quality? Are his sources balanced or biased? From everything I've seen, especially when compared to a lot of other streamers, Piker doesn't often provide sources for his claims. And because of this, when you combine the unknown nature of where he's getting information that leads him to such bad takes, 
if you're at all interested in consuming credible information, all you can really do is infer that his sources are low quality and highly biased. So then, after considering his lack of authority on the subject, deep biases, and the low effort he puts into the sources he uses to arrive at his positions, if I were grading his level of credibility on the subject of Ukraine, at best it's like a D. This then means, of the members of Piker's audience who want to consume credible content from credible voices, they don't have much of an aptitude for how to actually assess someone's credibility. Which means, most of the people who watch Piker are ambivalent about credibility, either in general or specifically with him. I don't think it's that great of a stretch to think that a significant portion of Piker's audience just want Piker to entertain them politically, similar to Joe Rogan. And if that's the case, one could argue that's not really that big of a deal if we understand what's really going on. In fact, I used to listen to JRE occasionally, not because I thought that he was a genius, but because he talked about interesting things in an interesting way and didn't take himself too seriously. And he also made it abundantly clear that his audience shouldn't take him that seriously either. But then things took a turn. They went in a really bad direction for Rogan when he started talking authoritatively about life and death matters that he had no credibility on. And because of the massive reach of Rogan's podcast, the law of big numbers dictated that some percent of his audience was going to take him seriously when they shouldn't have. And the consequences, of course, were massive. Not for him, not for Rogan, obviously, but for the world. And I would argue that Piker is doing the same thing, but with Ukraine. But what really matters at the end of the day, of course, is what kind of consequences there will be for Ukraine because of the positions of people like Piker. In other words, is it really that big of a deal that he's been so wrong about Ukraine? Well, it would be one thing if Piker were the only online leftist who's been so terribly wrong about Ukraine. In that case, I wouldn't be so concerned. Like, if he were to Ukraine what Jimmy Dore has been for COVID, and oh well. The problem is, Piker's not been alone on the left and having such terrible takes on Ukraine, and frankly aiding Russian invaders by spreading their propaganda to millions of people around the world, intentionally or not. I do believe that there have been and will continue to be consequences in Ukraine because of people like Piker, but it's too early to know how significant that damage will be. But here's the thing. The point of this video is that it isn't just about Ukraine. This is a much bigger problem for the left because credibility is much more important when you're trying to make leftward progress. And this is because unlike conservatism, where the goal is to move to the right or create stagnation or regression, moving left necessitates change and newness, which tends to scare a lot of people, especially the kind of people who vote with the greatest regularity. And the farther left you hope to move society, the more important it is to have credible voices making that case for you. We, the left, need to do some serious soul searching about who's out there making the case for our values. Who are we being guided by to get to the right policy choices and political calculations? Is the left really prepared to enter the 2022 midterms being guided by voices who are showing themselves to be not that credible? And what could happen to the left if we keep going down this road? Well, I would suggest that you ask some pre-Trump Republicans. See, Trump didn't just take the Republican brand farther right. He turned the Republican Party insane. Ultra right, yes, but also fucking crazy, which are two importantly, distinctly different characteristics, right wing and crazy. I know on the left, we like to assume these are synonymous things, but they're different characteristics. So should the left keep pushing Democrats further left? Absolutely. But should the left be led to moving all of our people into our own crazyville just because Republicans did in 2016? I sure as fuck hope not. Well, those are my thoughts. Here's what I want to know from you. First, do you agree with my hypothesis that the left has a credibility problem on its hands? And if, if you think I'm wrong, please tell me because I would love to be wrong. I'd also love to know what does credibility mean to you? What do you think makes a person uncredible? Can a person lose credibility? If so, how? How do you assess somebody's credibility? And do you believe that credibility matters, specifically with respect to creators? You know, should viewers care if the person they are watching is a credible person to make the case that they're making? 
Would you agree that there is danger in elevating less credible voices? I also want to know, what creators do you find to be not credible voices for the things that they advocate for? What makes them not credible? And on the flip side, what creators do you find to be credible voices for the things that they advocate for? And what makes them credible? I look forward to seeing your responses and seeing you next time. Смехнется дом